going to be speaking for us. DK, I've known DK since I was a boy. Um, I've been up to, when he was up in uh, Worsley in northern Alberta, uh, not as far as some of us have been up to Ray, but uh, um, Worsley is quite a ways up. I thought it was the end of the world when I first went there, and the mosquitoes are big there too. And uh, that's the first time I met him. I was a teenager, and uh, I remember meeting him as, as a teenager, and uh, I've gotten to grow to really love him and his family, Brenda and, and DK, and uh, Madeline and uh, Lena and, and Alexander all uh, appreciate them and, and the work that they've done and the help they've been to our family over the years. Um, DK has pastored a number of churches in, uh, in, the, in the U.S. and in Canada, and uh, one of the, our sister churches here in the city that he pastored for a number of years is Jasper Place Baptist Church. And um, he, he'll probably give you a little more information about himself, but it's really a pleasure that we have him speaking. DK is our associational ministry coordinator for the Midwest Baptist Association. And I'll let him try to explain what that is, because I'm not sure I can explain him as a moderator yet. But, uh, but we're, we're really privileged to have him come and to share on our mission Sunday uh, this morning. So we'll turn things over to him at this time. So. Thank you, Pastor Dennis. And, uh, it's great to have an opportunity to be here with you. Uh, I pray that God will bless uh, during our mission emphasis today. Uh, since I didn't intend these out earlier, do, do most of you have a pen with you? If not, you can remember it after. Huh? <laughs> so if you'll just pass those out, Dennis. Uh, I came to Canada when I was 10 years old. I moved from uh, Texas, north of Dallas, Texas, about 50 miles, and moved up to uh, Worsley, which is, if you know, where Grand Prairie, another uh, 200 kilometers home past Grand Prairie. And so that's where I actually grew up. And uh, Brenda was born in Canada, and uh, we've been married for 46 years. And so. Uh, that says an awful lot for her. She's a very good lady. She probably wouldn't have tolerated me this long. And uh, I surrendered to ministry August 1969. And so this coming August will be 42 years. Uh, about 30 years of that time, I was a pastor of churches. And Pastor Dennis said I pastored over at Jasper Place 10 and a half years. And I was pastor there when we built the building that's there now, the White Circle Rock Building. And I had a great ministry there. I did it since Dad, Pat, was one of my fellow pastors uh, in Edmonton at that time. And God called me out of a farming and ranching, logging and oil field background into ministry. And for one year, I told God, I will not be a pastor. Pastors are wimps. They're lazy. If they could get a real job, they wouldn't be a pastor. Well, then God has really made me have to eat those words many times because it's not a place for wimps and it's not a place that's easy. It's very hard, very tough to be a pastor, uh, especially in today's world. And so uh, pray for Pastor Dennis and Ardell. And uh, Maddie, when you're in a pastor's home, you have all kinds of extra pressure. And uh, we have two daughters, uh, two grandchildren, and uh, so I know the price that we pay with our children. They grew up. Uh, not having much interest in God, much interest in church. And so uh, I pray that today will be helpful to you. When Pastor Dennis asked me if I would come and, uh, and speak today, let me tell you first a little bit about what I'm doing now. Uh, as I said, I've pastored almost 30 years, worked for the convention 10 years, and then I've been working more in line with uh, the Midwest Association, started last October in a formal way. Uh, what the Midwest Association is, is about almost 50 churches and missions just like this one. Well, you're one of the biggest churches that we have. And so just remember, you're not from a small church in our perspective. This is one of the largest churches we have throughout the entire convention. Uh, of course, you'll run 300, 350 uh, when you put the children, you, the young adults, uh, adults together. And so thank you for, for letting me be here today to talk about uh, Midwest is Alberta. Northwest Territory, and we're trying to get something started in the Yukon. How many of you have been to Ray, Northwest Territory, mission trip? Okay, so you, you have a good uh, knowledge about it. David and Glenda Shedd are very good friends of mine and Brenda's. Uh, I try to make it there at least once a year and sometimes twice uh, to go there and spend time at their home. 
to work with the youth, work with the adults. Uh, we help provide money. You know, the second building they have there, not the church building, but the second one, we help provide some money to help build that building so that they would have a place to teach kids and uh, to minister to kids there and do other kinds of things. We also uh, support pretty heavy. Probably a lot of you know Jason Shine. Uh, Jason is funded uh, quite a bit, at least, from the Midwest Association. Uh, churches, like this church, gives every month to the Midwest Association that it's allocated into budget. Student work, uh, Edmonton, Calgary, a little bit in Grand, uh, Fairview and some places like that. You're also uh, very much involved in planting new churches uh, where we're starting some new ones. And, uh, and by the way, we have three new pastors in Alberta that have come within the last uh, month and a half. There's a new Korean pastor here for New White. Uh, he's been here about a month and a half. In uh, Calgary, there's a church called Cambrian Heights. Uh, they have a new pastor that will be there the first Sunday of June. And then another one over where uh, Rob Blackaby, the president of the seminary, used to pastor. They will have a new pastor there uh, by the first Sunday of July. Uh, I move around a fair amount in what I do. Last Sunday morning, uh, I was preaching at the Vietnamese Community Church in Calgary. Sunday afternoon, I preached at the Mandarin Chinese Church in Calgary. Uh, we're here today with you, the 29th of this month. I will preach in the morning uh, at Truth a Chinese Church. And then in the afternoon, uh, I will preach at an ordination service for a young Korean pastor. And so all of those are through translators. And uh, it's, it, I enjoy it because it helps me get an opportunity to get to be more involved with your culture and who you are. And uh, we're grateful to have uh, Evans Chinese Baptist a part of Midwest and a part of the convention. Uh, so we bless you for that. Also, I want to encourage you, uh, some of you may have a sense of call and missions of various kinds. Uh, there's a tremendous need in the... Uh, uh, this summer even, if some of you want to get a team together, I understand you're not going to go to Ray uh, this summer. So maybe you want to get a team together and uh, go to Worsley. That's a church that I surrendered to the ministry in. And they're building a new auditorium, a new sanctuary this summer. So if a bunch of you want to get together and go up some Sunday afternoon and then come back the next Saturday, that would be great. You can talk to Pastor Dennis and he can get you connected to, uh, and then I'll tell you what to do to go there. So... Uh, you need to go there and help some of those old people that will be there working. You know, we've got the old, us old people, the white hairs, the blue hairs, and the no hairs. And then we have you, and then we have the children. Have, have any of you have gone to a summer youth celebration? Any of you? Oh, yeah, there are a few of you have been there. Uh, in 2007, I was the camp pastor. I uh, preached every morning, every night for five days. And now you have two camps. And so uh, probably maybe some of you I remember from there. I want to uh, share with you from the, from the Bible. Uh, Dennis, Pastor Dennis said I can preach as long as I want to since I'm just a guest and you for the first time. So uh, we'll preach till we get finished. No, really what he told me was that somewhere about 12 o'clock all of you were going to leave but I could stay here and preach as long as I wanted to but there will be nobody here. So uh, I'm going to try to be finished and leave when you do. If that's alright. Let's pray and then we'll look right into the Bible. Lord Jesus, thank you today for who you are, for how much you love us, how much you care for our lives. We thank you that you have meaning and purpose for us. We don't have to just sort of drift through life and not accomplish anything. But Lord God, you let us be your servants. You let us follow you. And thank you for the friendships and the relationships we have with one another because of our faith in Christ. Lord, I pray that this morning those who really know you, who really placed their faith in you, who really surrendered to you, God, would you bless our time together? And if there would be any in this room today, then in the honesty of their own heart, they would acknowledge that I really have never given my life to Jesus. I've never asked Him to forgive my sins. I've never asked Him to come into my life. I've never followed Him in being obedient in, in profession and baptism and becoming a part of a church. Lord, I pray that today you would touch our hearts and you'll challenge us, you'll renew us. May we go away from here with a desire to be a little more like you than we were when we came. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles today, I hope you'll 
follow along with me. I will be using a, a little New American Standard Version Bible that I got from the Gideons. And uh, so if you have your Bible, uh, it may read a little bit different, but uh, I'll use this one for today. Uh, you know, I think all of us that know the Lord Jesus Christ, one of the things that we certainly want to know uh, in our own hearts is what kind of church and what kind of people does God use in His kingdom work? I mean, not just everybody that comes along and says, I'm going to serve Jesus. Uh, he can't use that unless we make some commitments within our heart. And so I want to pull from the Bible today the kind of churches and the kind of people that God will really use in His work. The first reference comes out of Luke chapter 22 and verse 42. Uh, Telling about the kind of people. But let, let me back up and give a little bit of an introduction. So I'll try to be finished as well. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 36 through 38, here's what Jesus is said about Jesus. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Uh, after having been in ministry uh, probably about 35 years, I woke up one morning and thought, I am sick and tired. I am fed up with religion. You know what that means? Just to be, I'm, just, I'm tired of it. I don't want any more religion. And so I began to pray and I said, Lord Jesus, don't make me work with religious people. Let me find those who are really committed to Jesus Christ and let me work with them. Because there's a big, big difference in being religious People say, well, I'm not very religious. It's okay. I'm not religious either. But I have a strong belief in Jesus Christ. I remember exactly when I gave my life to Him as a young boy. And I have yielded my life to Him to follow Him. And, and here's some of the things that He said. I use people in churches in Luke 22, 42 that says, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. When did he make that statement? Where was he? And when did he make that statement? Yes. Back here with your hand up. Oh, sorry. When he was um, in Gethsemane praying because he knew he was going to go to the cross. That's right. When he was in Gethsemane praying, when he knew he was going to go to the cross. Why was he going to go to the cross? To die for the sins of people. And this was his prayer. He said, Father... If there's any other way, if you're willing, remove this cup. Take this away. I, I'm not spiritually suicidal. I don't want to just die for people's sin. But then he quickly came back and said, but not my will, yours be done. So the kind of people that God uses are individuals who are surrendered to the will of God. In fact, what that means is, is at your age, whatever that age is, you would say, God, what is it you want to do with my life? What do you want me to do in, in your kingdom work? What kind of mission trips do you want me to be on? Do you want me to even be a minister? Do you want me to be a missionary? Do you want me a, a Bible teacher? Do you want me to just work with my hands uh, in a secular world but live for you? But it's the kind of people who will, will say right up front, Lord God, I am surrendered to your will. Now when you surrender to someone else's will, what does that mean about your own? You give it to Him. You don't lose a sense of, well, I have no value now. I'm a nobody. I'm worth nothing. No. You said, Lord God, everything you made me to be, I surrender that. I yield that. I give that to you. And I'll do what you want to. For one year, after I knew that God was wanting me to be a pastor, for one year I said, no. No, no, no. Because I didn't want to be a pastor. I didn't want to be a minister. I wanted to work for farming and ranching. I wanted to work for oil companies. I wanted to work in the, in the logging companies. But God just kept on picking at my heart and there came a time when I finally said, not my will, but thine be done. So if you want to get started on a good journey with the Lord Jesus, one of the first things you have to do is say, not my will, but I'll surrender and do whatever you want me to do. Second, comes out of Mark chapter 14, verse 3 through 9, and I'm going to focus only on verse 6 through 8. God uses churches and people who will do everything they can do either for Jesus or with Him. Here's the passage. While He was in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper and reclining at the table, there came a woman with an alabaster vial of costly perfume of 
pure nard. And she broke the vial and poured it over his head. But some were indignantly remarking to one another, Why has this perfume been wasted? This perfume might have been sold at over 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. So here's what happened. The lady came, took the most expensive perfume she had, broke it and poured it over Jesus' body. And then when, when the people around saw that, they said, How stupid. To waste that perfume to waste that by pouring it on his body. We could have sold that and given that money to the poor rather than wasting it. Now here's what really happened. Those folks said, I don't like to sit by somebody else that's put Jesus first and that we give to him. And I think the embarrassment was, you know when the, when the offering plate goes by, or I, like, I like your little uh, sacks here, little bags. Because it's not giving so that everybody else can see how much we give. That's not what it, See here, when they do that, uh, that was kind of neat. Because when, when you take your offer, I took mine, and I shove it in here, no one except God and you knows how much put in here. Then when somebody else counts, they don't have a clue who put in what, unless you put an envelope, which is not a bad thing, write your name on it, so you get tax deduction. But when you do that, you're not giving that other people see you and brag on you and feel real good about you. But most folks do not give of their earnings to God, at least not very much. Uh, have you ever noticed how interesting it is? God asks that we give how much back to Him through the church of two million. What percentage are we supposed to give back to Him? Twenty. Huh? Twenty. Ten. Ten percent. All right. But have you noticed how hard it is? Now follow me here. How hard it is for folks to give ten percent of their earnings back to God? Boy, that, that doesn't happen by many people. You know, we throw in 50 cents, it's good. We go to a restaurant, and we eat in a restaurant. What is the expected gratuity or the expected tip? What percent? Huh? 10? 15. 15% is the expected tip today. I was in a place last week, uh, Tuesday, when I got ready to pay my bill and they brought the receipt to me, it had already written on there. I didn't have a choice. 20% tip for the waitress who carried the food from the kitchen to my table. Pretty good pay. 20%. And yet when we talk about giving to God, we think, oh, wow. You know, 10% is pretty wild. That's pretty ridiculous, isn't it? Not really because it goes to reach people around the world. Reading then, uh, going on down with me. They started scolding her. All the people that started making fun of her and getting on criticizing. You know, what a waste, how dumb that was. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you bother her? She has done a good thing to me. For you will always have the poor with you. And whenever you wish, you can do good to them. But now notice this next statement. Remember we said we surrender our will to God. Here he says, but you will, uh, but you do not always have me. She has done what she could. See, it's not how much you can give or how much I can give. Surrender to God means I will do everything I possibly can for the Lord God. I will help to get His Word out. I'll help people who are in need. I'll do it in the name of Jesus Christ. Brenda and I, I'm 64 years old, and I made a choice. I made a choice to begin working with the Midwest Association for $1,500 a month. You know, and I go figure, make that much working for Tim Hortons or McDonald's. But I said, because God spoke to me and said, come and work with these churches. Work with the Edmonton Chinese Baptist. Work with Calgary. Work with Ray Edson. Work with these churches. And when he said to do that, I said, I will do what I can do. All God asks of you today is in your heart. First, when you yield to Him, then you just be honest and say, Lord God, I'll do everything I can. You equip me. Uh, you give me the ability. You give me the wisdom. You tell me what you want me to do, and I'll do it. Uh, and I think that's where I would encourage you today. And then the, the third one. Churches and people who will, because of Jesus, give their best. Now, this is the one where... Uh, in uh, Mark chapter 12, verse 41 34, uh, Jesus said one day, I'm going to go down to the temple and I'm going to watch how people do their giving. And when he got there, 
he said the only some of them gave quite a bit, some didn't give very much. But one person he picked out and commented on how much she gave. Who was that? Is a widow. Someone whose husband had died, someone that had children. And uh, he observed her and he said, You know, some gave a lot, some not much, but this one widow gave all that she had and all that she had to live on. Now, when you hear TV preachers saying, Send me a hundred bucks, and, uh, and you know, it's going to triple or it's going to double, take part of that and go stop by yourself a hamburger because that's a bunch of baloney. It's just not true. But when we expect it to give back to God so that other people can come to know about Him. And uh, when He used that, it's kind of like when the Lord Jesus Christ gives to us. When I lived in Florida and was going to Bible college, boy, they had a lot of, a lot of older ladies in there. And they were phenomenal cooks. And they would invite Brenda and uh, me and our two daughters to go to their house. Every Sunday we went to someone else's house. Well, you can see what happened to them. Uh, you know, they fed good. And one of the things that I learned to really like there was what they call a seven layer cake. It was a little cake, chocolate cake, about that thick. And then the chocolate icing was about the same thing. And then another cake, more icing. On seven layers. You know, it makes you drool even thinking about it, doesn't it? But let's just say that uh, one of these young ladies heard that Brenda and I liked those chocolate cakes. So she made one when we came to church. She said, uh, Pastor DK, I heard you like these seven layer chocolate cakes. We made one for you today, and you and Brenda can take it when you go home. Wow, very wonderful. But at the end of the service, she comes back and says, Pastor Dennis said that we've had someone in the church that's been hurt in the car wreck. And so we're going to go, lots of people are going over to their house to pray for them. And we need some cake, we need some coffee or tea. So could I have some of that cake back so that I could take it with me? And I would look at them and say, no way. That's mine. You gave it to me. I don't have to give it back. See, what you and I have, if we understand correctly, it's not ours. We are stewards or managers of what God entrusts to us. Some of us He entrusts more to than others. But we're responsible to Him for what I do with it. This said, this lady put it all back on the altar for Him. Now, he may have taken him some back and said, here, you can live on this. But her heart said, I don't own anything. Everything that Brenda and I have, a house, a pickup, a car, a minivan. Now, the newest was a 2004, and the old one was a 2000, but that's okay. They still, still run. So, when God gave to us, what are we supposed to do with it? Give it back to His work. And so then the fourth one. God is looking for churches and people who are prepared. No, I got one more before that. Number four. People and churches who will trust God for the unbelievable, the impossible. In Luke chapter 9, verse 12 through 17, this is where Jesus had been out ministering all day. And crowds and crowds of people were following him around, watching what he was doing. And it came supper time, and he said to his disciples, uh, have the people to all be seated and we're going to have something to eat. And he, the, the disciples said, we don't have anything. Uh, we had a potluck lunch and we don't have anything left. And he said, go look again. And then they found uh, a little boy that had some fish and some loaves of bread. And they brought it back and they said, wow, how are we going to do? We've got 5,000 men here. How are we going to feed them with a couple of loaves and a couple of fish? We can't do that. Then again, he said, you have the people to be seated. And what does it say that he did with that bread and that fish? It said that he took it, he received it, and what did he do next? It said he blessed it. it. means he prayed for it. Meaning if you and I will bring who we are and what we have and give it to him and ask him to bless it, then he multiplies it. And he said, seat them, he blessed it, and started serving them. He served 5,000 people. And when he got finished, he told them, go pick up what's left. You remember how much they picked up? How many did baskets? Twelve baskets. How many disciples did he have with him at that time? Twelve. You know what the object lesson was? The Lord God 
not only meets our needs, but He leaves some left over for ministry as we go our way. Twelve disciples, twelve baskets. And when they went home, He said, now you're going to go buy some people who need you to give to them what I have given to you. Personally, I like a good buffet. You can tell that. We have a good Chinese buffet in Cochrane. We have some other buffets. And the reason I, I like a buffet for one reason is I don't like to wait. I have no patience. You know, you go in, you sit down, and it takes 30 minutes for the waitress to come. And then the waitress takes your order, and it takes another 30 minutes to get the food. And then when you get finished, it takes another 15 minutes for them to come and give you your bill. So, you know, you've had about two hours for 20 minutes of eating. I like a buffet. Walk in, you get it, you eat, you leave. But one thing I don't like about buffets is when you walk in, there's no one in the line ahead of you. I don't like that. Here's why. When you get up to the, to, the, to the food display, somebody will usually come out from the kitchen, you know, with a long spoon, and they'll stir it up, pull it in a pot, make it look good, it's kind of all about presentation. That means that that food's not very fresh. I like it where just when you get there, they come from the kitchen, pull out one almost empty, and put in a new one. I think people around us today, to make that example and illustration work, People don't want to just hear what you did in your life for Christ 5, 10. When I preach a lot of old people, you know, they made a decision for Christ. They surrendered to Christ 50 or 60 years ago. But nothing fresh has happened. Nothing new has happened. It's like eating old food on a buffet bar. We'd rather have something fresh. So what, what has God done in your life in the last week, the last month? You know, if I were to sit down, you and I were visiting, I'd say, tell me what God's done in your life in the last month. Tell me what God's doing in your life right now. I love to ask uh, young people. You know, uh, we got out of school. I met two boys yesterday that I'd never met before, teenagers. I asked them, what are you, how old are you? Well, I'm in grade 12. I graduate this spring. And the other one said, I graduate in grade 11. And they, I'm in 11. I graduate next year. So I asked the question, what is God going to do in your life after that? You know, what are you going to be? What are you going to do? Let me say to you, I pray that you will just trust God for some unbelievable things, impossible things in your life. Don't just try to figure out, okay, with my mind, I believe I can do this. Trust God to do things that are unbelievable. When He fed that crowd, that was not believable. And so you need to do that. And then my last point is in Galatians chapter 6, verse 17 and 18. Uh, this is where God wants churches and people who are prepared in this translation, it'll say to bear the brand marks of Jesus on their body. Now here's what Paul was saying. Uh, I told you a while ago, I came from a farming and ranch background. Now, maybe you don't ever watch cowboy movies. But when you watch any of the cowboy movies, a lot of times when they would they would take cattle and, and brand them, put a brand on them. Why did they put a brand on there? What was the purpose of it? To tell you who owned those cattle. Whose cattle are these? Man, when I was a kid, uh, 8, 9, 10, 12 years old, 15 years old, and my dad would make me and my brothers help him brand all of our cattle. Take a hot iron and brand them so that we knew whose they were. Because we hauled them to a great big pasture where they would put four or 5,000 cattle from different owners in one pen. So the only way you could identify yours was the ones that had your brand, had my dad's brand on Today, I think that a lot of people are having a hard time telling if you're a Christian or not. Am I a Christian or not? Now, when Paul says here, they were willing to bear the brand marks of Jesus on their body, it means that there should be something about us that says, he belongs to Jesus, or she belongs to Jesus. It's, it's a mark of... Four marks. One, of compassion. Uh, a, lot, a lot of people today need your love. They need your care. I don't know how many of you know, but I know lots of people today, homes, where the marriage is hurting. The dad's hurting because he lost his job. The mother's hurting because uh, the husband's abused or their kids are hurting because they don't have proper clothing. They don't have proper food. They don't have what they need. They need somebody like you and me to show compassion on them. To let them know somebody loves you. Somebody cares about you. Boy, the world is full of people right now 
that do not know if anybody loves me, if anybody cares. And a lot of them are pastors and their wife and their children. And a lot of them are youth, teenagers, college age, who said, I've surrendered my life to the Lord, but right now I need some compassion. It's also a mark of surrender. Remember we said right at the very beginning, not my will, but thine be done. Are you holding on to your life? Or are you saying to God, God, give me leadership and guidance? Pretty hard to know what to do when you look around and see what's happened in, in Yemen, in Libya, in Syria, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and all the problems that we're going to, beginning to have in Canada. We come back and say, Lord, I, I think it's best if I just surrender my life to you. Mm -hmm.